Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. You've landed at the CAF COVID Weekly Roundup. My name's Jason Belden. I'm the Director of Emergency Preparedness for CAF. Uh, with me today is Patty Owens, Direct Director of Regulatory Affairs for CAF. Uh, it's April 30th. Um, it's one o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, and today we're going to discuss the CMS QSOs that came out this week. We'll, um, we'll definitely cover where we think they they are going to differ from CDPH's AFLs. Um, we'll talk about the CDC guidance and, and what, um, we'll kind of recap what Dr. Epson spoke about on, on Wednesday and talk about where we think uh, the AFL on, um, on both visitation and testing are gonna land at. Uh, and then we'll talk about the vaccine, uh, some information on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as well as uh, uh, vaccine results um, or studies done for uh, pregnant women um, and uh, vaccine. So I wanted, I know that was a question uh, on the HSAG call, so I, I found some research uh, done by New, New England Journal of Medicine. Anyways, we'll, we'll cover that. Uh, we'll talk about um, kind of the results of that uh, uh, study. All right, um, so with our traditional um, introduction to the webinar, I just want to reiterate that um, the speaker's opinions expressed are their own. They may not reflect CAF's official position. These webinars are brought to you as a part of a grant funded program with uh, CDPH and Los Angeles County EMS Agency. I have no financial conflicts, uh, nor does Patty. Um, we're both solely employed by CAF, as far as I know anyways. <laughs> Uh, the intent of the webinars is to give you a situational report. Uh, a lot of times that's uh, us explaining uh, regulatory uh, guidance uh, to you guys, and that's what we'll concentrate mostly on this. Uh, we will forecast to do some forecasting where we think the AFLs will, will differ from the CMS QSOs. And then if we have time or we identify best practices to help you meet those, we'll include that as well. All right, so let's hop to the first update. I'm going to take these in numerical order. Um, both of these CMS QSOs were updated on the 27th. I, I'm not sure which one came out first, but we'll, we'll talk about the one that, as it relates to uh, facility testing requirements. And this is the one um, we we have. Uh, we know that uh, CDPH was working on an AFL prior to the issuance of this uh, CMS QSO, and so we kind of have an idea of where. Uh, um, uh, CDPH is going to land on on some of these things. They may uh, adjust the AFL. So what CDPH has advised, I guess the most important thing really is to say that until they issue uh, a revised AFL, we're going to stand by um, in operationally operationalizing the QSO guidance until um, CDPH has issued an AFL that talks about what is allowed and what's not. Um, in the QSO, let's talk about where it uh, differentiated from previous versions. In terms of, um, it did add a, a definition for fully and non-vaccinated folks, and those definitions are consistent with um, with uh, with what everybody else says about fully vaccinated. It's post two weeks of the second dose or post two weeks of the first dose of the Johnson & Johnson. Non-vaccinated, it is anybody that does not fit that uh, category. Um, for fully vaccinated staff, um, we anticipate this will probably be in the AFL as well. Uh, fully vaccinated staff will not need to be part of your screening testing. Um, I will say that the fully vaccinated staff will still need to be tested after an exposure or during response testing. That's going to be in the AFL. I'm almost certain of it. Uh, you can guarantee that that's still going to be a, a part of it. Um, in terms of fully vaccinated staff not needing to quarantine after an exposure, that's from the CDC guidance. I'm I'm really not so sure that uh, CDPH is going to adopt that, um, or if they do, it may be a modified version of that. So we'll have to wait really uh, on the AFL to see if that's going to make it into the AFL. As far as um, you, you know, what else went into the CMS QSO? There was a there's a, a number of uh, you know all of the same stuff, but in terms of when uh, when you do the testing, how you do the testing, who you report to, uh, you know the the type of testing that you can use, all of that stuff uh, stays the same. What we don't know is uh, clearly the CMS QSO. Uh, 
has listed uh, under 5%, the testing cadence would be once a month. I, I do not think that CDPH is going to adopt that. I think they're gonna keep the weekly cadence uh, for the non-vaccinated um, staff. Um, so I think that's likely to stay. I don't think uh, we're gonna go to once a month testing um, simply because uh, once a month is is really, it's, it's not very um, helpful when you're trying to use it to uh, mitigate outbreaks uh, if you're only looking at them once a month. Uh, we'll see how uh, CDPH lands on that, but I would assume that we're gonna have to do weekly uh, for the non-vaccinated folks still. And obviously the response testing, uh, outbreak testing, all of that stuff is going to stay the same. I don't anticipate that's going to change at all. All right, let's talk about the visitation guidance because this had more stuff that was uh, changing. Um, and uh, some of this, some of the stuff that's included in here was also included uh, or it links to the CDC guidance. And we're going to, I'll get to that in a, in, uh, in a second here, but let's talk about the visitation guidance. It was updated on the same day, uh, April 27th. Um, CDPH, oh, sorry, that should say uh, revised uh, visitation AFL. So that 20-22.7, that's going to get um, revised to um, to add in all these changes. Uh, CDPH has said stand by until issuance of the AFL before you operationalize these changes. So same with the first AFL. Uh, I do think these uh, both of these uh, AFLs are going to come out um, probably before Mother's Day. I know that was a real concern to be able to uh, get these um, changed in time to be able to uh, operationalize them for Mother's Day or Mother's Day weekend. Um, I will say uh, CMS added language in here that said facilities should allow indoor visitation at all times for all residents, regardless of vaccination status. That was uh, marked in red, so it's pretty important. They had the same recommendations to um, you know, to try to accommodate outdoor visitation. That's, you know, it's generally preferable. All that kind of same language stays in there, but they're really pushing um, to really incorporate indoor visitation. Uh, they do have some exceptions um, for unvaccinated residents. If the county positivity rate is greater than 10%, I, I don't think this applies to anywhere in the state now, but um, if we do get back to that point, um, unvaccinated residents, if their county positivity rate is above 10% and great, or less than 70% of residents are vaccinated, then you should not be doing indoor visitation for the unvaccinated residents. That's one of the exceptions. Uh, any resident with active COVID um, until they're off the transmission-based precautions uh, cannot have inside visits. And residents in quarantine, meaning those yellow zone residents, until they've been removed from uh, precautions. Uh, compassionate care visits are always allowed under any circumstance. It doesn't matter if they're in quarantine, if they have COVID or not, if it's a compassionate care situation, which is a pretty broad allowance. If you look at the language in the QSO, it's always allowed. All right, hop to the next section here. Uh, they added a section on indoor visitation during an outbreak. And this could be subject to pretty heavy revision from CDPH and, and, and or your local health department. In terms of uh, what, what they've said, um, in terms of allowing visit, indoor visitation during an outbreak, um, you, would, you would need to freeze admission or freeze um, the indoor visitation if you determined there was an outbreak, meaning one or more positive um, uh, tests. Those, uh, once you do that, if you do a round of testing and it shows no spread outside of the unit, you should, then you, um, then you may be able to um, accommodate indoor visits in areas that weren't affected by the outbreak. Um, it, it, um, in the CMS QSO, it ties uh, communal dining recommendations to the CDC C guidance. We'll, I'll go over that, cover that in a second here. And then if the resident is fully vaccinated, they can choose to have close contact, including touch with their visitor in, in accordance with that same CDC guidance. All right, let's hop to the next page. So um, in the CDC guidance, um, so when you look at the CMS QSOs, both of them are pretty heavily linked to the CDC guidance for infection control after vaccination. In that CDC guidance, it has a, a number of things. Uh, well, we'll go over each category. In terms of the testing recommendations, 
Um, it uh, aligns very similarly to the what's in the CMS Q QSO. It still recommends um, um, testing in all other scenarios, uh, meaning outbreak response testing for vaccinated folks. All that um, is still recommended by CDC as well as CMS. Um, they did also remove fully vaccinated from the screening testing, but like I said, I'm not certain that CDPH will uh, adopt that fully. We, we, we will see, but um, I'm not sure they will. In terms of the visitation recommendations, um, it has the same restrictions um, or, you know, kind of guidance as CMS. So, you know, the core principles of infection prevention and control, all those things, screening, symptom checks, um, hand hygiene, uh, source control, just, you know, that long list of things that all need to be accomplished. It's the same in the CDC as it in, is in the CMS uh, QSO. It's just they don't call it core principles. They call it something different. Um, it did go on to explain that uh, folks should be explaining the risk to residents and their family members about um, the risk of visitation. Uh, visitors must wear source control while moving through the building and physically distance from others. So. Um, the changes we're going to see um, are, are likely to require um, are really focused around vaccinated staff uh, or vaccinated residents and vaccinated visitors. Um, hand hygiene, obviously, before and after contact, but both fully vaccinated, both the resident and the staff member may choose to have full touch without source control, but they must be alone in their visit. They can't be in a in a. Um, Let's say you, you set up a visitation space that can accommodate multiple people visiting at the same time. You have physical separation, um, but you don't have separation of the air. And so in, in those instances where you're more than, uh, you know, one group of people are going to be vaccinated together, regardless of their vaccination status, they need to have uh, source control on. Now, in the case where a resident is fully vaccinated and their visitor is not fully vaccinated, the visitor may choose uh, touch, but they should maintain uh, source control. Now, that's not the recommendation, but that is an allowance. Um, they still recommend uh, physical distancing and source control, but at a minimum, you have to keep the source control if the uh, visitor is not uh, vaccinated. All right. In terms of um, communal activities and dining, um, fully vaccinated residents are going to be able to resume dining activities without masking or social distancing as long as in, uh, uh, there are not va unvaccinated individuals present. And that's going to be really kind of difficult for you guys to operationalize. I think what's probably best is you're going to have to divide up. If you've not, I, I'm, I'm probably, I'm guessing you guys have done this already, but if not, think about dividing the residents up in the green zone by by you know vaccination status so that you can understand you could maybe do dining in two um, uh, you know separate groups and they, you could have a group that's vaccinated and a group that's unvaccinated the group that's vaccinated obviously um, can can do the without masking or social distancing um, but as soon as an unvaccinated individual is present whether it's a healthcare worker or uh, another resident they're uh, the residents would be expected to practice uh, source control and, and physical distancing. Uh, well, physical dis the, the unvaccinated person needs to stay physically distanced from the uh, vaccinated folks. Fully vaccinated healthcare personnel uh, can dine and socialize together in break rooms and conduct in-person meetings without source control or physical distancing unless an unvaccinated individual is present. Unvaccinated residents need to continue to use source control measures and remain socially distanced from others. Um, I, you know, this, uh, I, I don't know where CDPH is gonna land on this. I think they're gonna be pretty consistent with this. Um, it sounds like based on the the slides that we, we, um, we saw Dr. Epson present on Wednesday, it, it sounds like this, but the, I've not seen a draft of this AFL yet. Um, but uh, it, it, I believe it's uh, it should be out very, very soon. In terms of work restrictions and quarantine, um, it went on to say, and, and I think we've covered this before, but fully vaccinated healthcare personnel no, need, no longer need to quarantine if asymptomatic. Um, that's another one that I think CDPH may, um, may not fully 
pop on board with, they may say that uh, fully vaccinated healthcare personnel should still continue to quarantine. We'll see. That's one of those ones where we're not quite sure how CDPH is going to fall in this. Uh, and all residents still need to quarantine after exposure. And, and I know for certain that's going to stay. Um, and we've talked to CDPH about that. All right. I want to hop to the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine, the, the Janssen vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. The pause was lifted. There was a um, there's been a number of um, uh, kind of messages about this by folks that are much, you know, more competent than I am in, in, in explaining this. But uh, I just wanted to give you some highlights. Um, the CDC has reviewed nearly 8 million uh, doses of the, that vaccine from March through April. Um, the report went on to say that there were 17 events uh, consistent with that TTS or the thrum. Um, I can't, I'm not even going to try it. So, um, but one of the big things that um, that I took from this was no other deaths appeared to have an association with vaccine, and and it does not. It, it appears the risk is most elevated for women in the 18 to 49 range. So, if you have staff in that 18 to 49 range that you're looking at um, getting vaccinated that have not been vaccinated before. You know, it may be worth it for you to try to see if you can find other uh, other uh, sources of vaccine, if if that's what uh, the staff member would would prefer. I, I I mean, I would try to accommodate them if I could find another uh, type of vaccine. One, I want to make sure everybody's vaccinated, um, and two, I want them to feel as comfortable as they can be with the vaccine uh, that they're going to take. So for uh, for those um, women in that category, especially that's a lot of our staff, uh, if they feel more comfortable, try to find, um, uh, you know, the either Moderna or Pfizer. All right, I want to hop to, um, I know that there were some folks that had brought up um, questions or had brought up points that some of the vaccine hesitancy has come from uh, pregnant um, uh, staff members, whether that's uh, frontline staff or other folks in the building that are pregnant. Um, New England Journal of Medicine did a study, and I thought it was interesting. I wanted to just cut out the highlights. Um, normally, we have handouts on the side, but we, we were having technical difficulties this morning with the handouts. So we sent um, the handouts with the slides to everybody that pre-registered for the webinar. So you should have a copy of this study. Uh, if not, you can click on the link, and it's got a number of of kind of uh, tables and graphs that make it easy. Maybe if you want to present it to um, to your staff, if they're you know concerned about um, uh, possible complications with their pregnancy. Now, the, this study was done on both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. It, the the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, I, I don't believe, was included in this study. Uh, it some of the highlights were the proportion proportions of adverse pregnancy and neonatal outcomes in vaccinated preg pregnant women were similar to incidents recorded in pre-pandemic studies of pregnant men meaning the um, adverse events and the neonatal outcomes that were observed in the study tend to follow the same kind of statistical uh, model that the normal public would have um, the authors or the researchers of the thing said such comparisons are helpful to provide a crude sense of whether there are any unexpected safety, safety signals in these early data. And, um, you know, I'm not a uh, obstetrician and, and, and certainly, uh, you know, if um, one of your staff members is pregnant, they should have a conversation with their um, healthcare provider or, you know, their their physician to make um, sure that they understand the risk and benefits. But I wanted to make you aware that there were some studies that have been done on this. And some of the results can be uh, seen here. Um, in terms of where the non-pregnant folks fall, uh, fall under the, you know, kind of traditional um, uh, severe or symptomatic outcomes we have after, after a vaccine, the, the rate in which uh, pregnant women and non-pregnant women um, uh, have these uh, conditions uh, are very, very similar across the board. It does look like they, they suffer both more fatigue and pain at the injection site than the, uh, the rest of the folks that, that were included in the study. 
And then for all the remainder of the things like headache, myalgia, chills, and fever, it seemed to be they were less impacted by those. So it's, uh, you know, I don't know if that's a statistical anomaly, but it, it certainly leads uh, one to just a gross estimation that it, it is very, very similar to uh, what other folks are experiencing. So I wanted to give that information to you guys before, um, uh, just in case you, you um, had some pregnant staff that had some misgivings about uh, getting the vaccine. So with that, I don't have a whole lot else. We had a, a very short thing, a, a very short amount of changes. Those um, CMS QSOs will hit AFLs and I, until we get the official AFL, I don't want to say, you know, you guys are going to run out and do this right now, um, but I do anticipate next Friday we'll be reviewing how the AFLs differed from the CMS QSO. Patty, did you have anything you wanted to add on the CMS QSOs or, or, um, or anything like that? I know there's some questions um, that I want to post to you in the, in the question section, but uh, is there anything else you wanted to add on the CMS QSOs? Oh, I may have lost Patty. I don't I didn't see her on here. So that's okay. We're going to hop to the questions anyway. So if you guys oh, have. I'm sorry. Hi, no, that's Jason. A... I'm so sorry. I was um, actually, it was a user um, issue. I was pressing <laughs> the wrong button to unmute. Um, sure. I just wanted to add in. I just wanted to add in the fact that, um, you know, we also. I don't know if you mentioned it earlier. Um, um, on that visitation AFLs, we are. Um, there's going to be one um, distinctly for ICFDDs, um, uh, and so we're really looking forward to that one as well. Yeah, great, great point. So if you're an ICF provider that's on the call, we do. We we know that the, uh, there is a, a visitation AFL that's going to land pretty soon. We took. Uh, a gander at a, a first draft of the AFL and it needed some revisions in order for it to be consistent with this new CDC guidance that came out uh, on Wednesday. So we, we've got, um, or uh, Tuesday, I'm sorry. Um, so they've got a little work to do to incorporate those changes in there. Uh, the first draft we saw did not incorporate any of those. So there's definitely some changes needed, but they uh, they did say essentially that it's any day now we're going to get it and and uh we've asked them to you know kind of capture information on uh or put in inf uh, guidance on what what to do when folks leave the home and, and then return uh, yeah when, but specifically for the home visit yeah yeah and that's a really really common uh, uh concern or question from the icf providers we hope that the um that the language of the AFL definitely addresses it. And certainly we've given them uh, indication that it should address it. So. All right, I'm gonna hop to the first question. And this one's for you, Patty. Um, where, are the new <laughs> where are the new 2021 SNF CDPH annual survey entrance conference worksheets and guidelines? Do you know? Yes, I do. Um, the CMS site has been updated to reflect all the newest forms for this the start of the resumption of surveys. Um, I have the link. I can send it over to Jamie. Um, we can get it posted um, for everyone. Um, I did put it out on the CAF forum. So if you're not signed up for the Google group um, CAF forum, make sure you are. I, I put all the current links for every updated survey tool, survey guidance, entrance sheet, resources, every resource for survey that was just updated by CMS. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Penny. All right. So the next question was, will the slides be available for download? Hopefully I answered that, but um, we should be mailing you out a copy of the slides and the handouts. So the handouts will be the CMS QSOs, as well as the um, New England Journal of Medicine study. It's it's a 10-page report. It's not very long. Um, I will. Uh, Jason, I, oh, go ahead, Jamie. I was just going to say, I will be sending that out um, again after this presentation. Awesome. Thank you. And I was just going to jump in and say this, Patty. If anyone, um, if, if you want to email me at um, coins.cap.org for those um, CMS um, links for all the newest um, survey ready stuff, I can, I will gladly email it as well. Yeah, for sure. Or, or you know, Pat, Patty or I, either one of us, if you email it to us, we'll make sure you get to the right spot. 
The unvaccinated will always be among us. What do we do with them? Tell them they're not welcome? Well, that's certainly, um, it almost, uh, it is uh, definitely um, kind of I uh, isolates folks that uh, choose not to be uh, vaccinated and it, and it puts a spotlight on them. For, for the residents, um, uh, gosh, you know, it, I, I don't have to look at many of these MMWRs to see how insanely protective the vaccine is against uh, this versus not being vaccinated. And uh, so, you know, for those folks, if they're a resident and they're they're choosing not to be vaccinated, not their family members choosing not to be vaccinated, I would, you know, I try to work with them to develop some kind of person-centered approach to engaging them, um, making them feel okay with their decision um I, outside of you know that kind of human component where we explain to them look the risk of you being among these other people I, I i recognize and respect your decision to not be vaccinated but it you represent a, a risk to the other folks in the building and we we need to um we we need to keep folks separated that have not been vaccinated i i know that's a hard <laughs> thing to tell but gosh, um, it it really it does pose a risk for folks. For the unvaccinated. Well, yeah, oh, go ahead. I was going to jump in too. Um, I was just going to say, you know, we look at to being creative. We just, you know, went on a normal routine with our activities, our dining programs. You may have to separate things out for, um, you know, not stating it. Obviously, this is for vaccinated or unvaccinated. But figuring out ways to change the daily routine of the facility to incorporate. Um, the different types of people like we do any any everyone's different in our facilities so now with the vaccine or non-vaccinated same thing you're just going to have to be you know creative look at things differently and how you're going to you're going to still have it um, person-centered on everything you do yeah and um and i realize for the the staff it's it's really uh you know it's a, a big spotlight on them and there are some you know, valid reasons for not being vaccinated. Some have, uh, you, you know, um, other things with their health that would, would compromise them by getting vaccinated or folks, maybe they're pregnant. And I, I understand that as a, a parent and somebody that, you know, struggled to get pregnant, uh, you know, it, you know, I, I fully, I'm right on board with the folks that are uh, pregnant that, that have, you know, concerns about the vaccine, but in terms of what our actions are, I, I really think we we want to encourage folks to be vaccinated. And and if we make it uncomfortable for them at work and and know that they're not um, they're not among the norm, if their their choice is just because they don't believe in the vaccine, then uh, those folks I want them to be uncomfortable. That's not a good decision if you're a healthcare worker, in my opinion. Um, but that's that's just the way it is. I, I, I don't know what to do to overcome that. Um, we, we definitely want to encourage it. And if this helps push folks to do that, uh, I, I want to do that, especially for our staff. For the residents, I get it. We, we've got to make them feel um, okay about their decision. Um, you know, uh, and I realize the staff have that same kind of thought process, but it's more than than just them, and if they're not going to be um, vaccinated, then we have to include them in our testing regimen. And there may be uh, differences in the PPE that they're required to wear. So um, all that leads to try to get them vaccinated, really. Um, especially if you've only got like you know 80% of your staff vaccinated, or 70%, or 60%, it's going to be really hard to operationalize you know, uh, meeting together without masks and without distancing if half of your staff are, are unvaccinated. Hopefully, if the testing guidance comes out, those folks will be tired of getting that thing stuck up their nose uh, and, uh, and and then not want to do that every week. And, and maybe that'll lead some more folks to getting vaccinated. I'm not sure. What about visitation guidelines for vaccinated visitor and unvaccinated resident? That's a great point. Um, I'm assuming that will uh, that will come in the AFL, but I, I anticipate since the risk is to the resident, the unvaccinated resident would be, um, we would be uh, talking about, you know, six foot distance, source control, all the same kind of um, requirements um, if, the, uh, if the visitor was unvaccinated. So I don't, um, I think 
uh, those changes are going to be they'll be they'll be addressed in the AFL, but I think they'll they'll follow the same um, kind of pattern. So for dining, if I have a staff not vaccinated, they're working that are working. Would my vaccinated residents not be able to follow the new guidelines because the healthcare personnel was not vaccinated? As it uh, as it stands, I think it was. Um, well, let me go look. I don't want to answer that question wrong. Uh, I'm going to look at the, the QSO real quick, and I'll see if I can uh, get you the answer to that. So, Patty, did you have anything else you wanted to mention while I look at the uh, communal dining stuff? Okay. Yep, and so in the in the guidance, it does say that if the healthcare worker is unvaccinated then um then they uh, everybody needs to be masked and the healthcare worker needs to maintain uh physical distancing sorry about that and, and i would imagine that would probably make it into the afl as well is there any particular guidance regarding visitation by children you know i don't think it's you know there's some language in the afl on children it, it just basically says that you need to be able to you know if, if children are going to visit which is allowed um, they would have to follow the same infection prevention um, and control guidance, the core principles, uh, screened, you know, temperature, um, source control, hand hygiene, all that same stuff would apply. They added a caveat that children can, can visit provided you can make sure that they can't break um, those infection prevention and control measures. Um, so I, it's it is allowed. We want to do it uh, in a manner in which, you know, we can keep those folks uh, or um, keep the kids uh, contained within the area in which they're supposed to be visiting and not running around the facility or taking their mask off or doing those other things. So. For fully vaccinated healthcare professionals who traveled out of the country like India or Africa, do they have to quarantine for 14 days on arrival? That's a great question. You know, um, the CDC is constantly um, updating that guidance in the cdc guidance for the infection control it does talk about um uh, uh fully vaccinated healthcare professionals uh, no longer needing to quarantine uh, for 14 days on arrival but they are adding countries to that list i'd have to go look at it to see if india or africa were on there but the the point is regardless of whether it's india or africa or any other country um, if your staff member is traveling out of the U.S., you should probably click that link to make sure that that, that country is not on the the, uh, the list. And as things change throughout the world, we anticipate this probably is a, a fluid um, kind of thing. Like we've seen this change many, many times and, and where the sources of surges are throughout the world um, is, is going to change. And so... Um, the best part is, you know, just as a, a process for you, you should verify wh what country they're visiting uh, upon return to see if it requires quarantine. But for the most part, uh, it's no longer required that they quarantine uh, upon returning. Um, hi, Jason, are there best practice recommendations for Oh, Patty, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No, go ahead, Jason. But when you're done the questions, I did have something to add um, regarding the staffing audit process during the pandemic. I feel it's important to bring up today. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I got two, uh, three more questions. We'll get to that. Are there best practices recommendations for facilities whose family members heard of the CDC recommendations and now are anxious to visit their loved one? Ah, uh, that's a great. <laughs> that's a great point. I would say. Uh, you know, if you can uh, get them to postpone for another week or let them know that the California Department of Public Health reviews those recommendations and they may change uh, some of them. I, I'm certain they will change portions of it. And so it's Im important to tell them the CDC set out the recommendations. Department of Public Health is reviewing those recommendations to make sure they're consistent with our state guidance. Then they'll issue the AFL or the all facilities letter that gives us the operating uh, kind of criteria for how we do it now um you can still do visits and all that other stuff it's the uh, you know physical touch uh physical touch without source control um you know the communal dining that kind of stuff we've got to wait for uh cdph to uh, give us a, their take on that 
we are at 100% of vaccinated staff. There's new, there's new guidance saying that we don't have to test anymore. Uh, that's a, a great question. It's not 100% uh, or um, you would still have to test if you um, if you had a symptom at, let's say you had somebody develop symptoms that were consistent with COVID and you um, you tested them and they came out positive. If that was the case, then you're going to have to do response testing and outbreak testing until, you know, the two weeks is over and you've determined the scope of the outbreak. But in terms of the screening testing, um, the AFL, we anticipate it's going to say that uh, vaccinated staff, once they've completed that two weeks post-vaccine, do not have to be included in the screening testing. And so if you got 100% of vaccinated staff, that means your screening testing is going to be zero. So that's great. Um, uh, good for you. Good on you. Yeah, absolutely. So will visitation still need to be supervised? And so there's clear guidance throughout uh, the CMS QSO is that visitation is not a free for all. It should be uh, done in a manner that's consistent with your ability to maintain those infection prevention and control measures. So we wanna have visitation, but we wanna do it in a manner that, that we can make sure that every visitor is following those infection prevention and control uh, methods. Meaning, you know, we need to have we can't have 50 people standing out front waiting to get screened. We need to have a, uh, a process to do that. So it's more one, more efficient, and two, it doesn't compromise the life and safety of the residents or the staff in the building. So we wanna follow the infection control measures, do it in a measured way, uh, try to schedule it. I, I, I mean, I like the idea of scheduling it. I, I know that the, the, uh, the QSO is really broad and it doesn't really talk about you know, you should schedule this or schedule that. But if you look at all the components real, and you look at your built environment, what is your ability to be able to meet infection prevention and control guidance and to oversee the compliance of that uh, in these uh, visits? If if you can't do that, then then you need to limit the number of visits so that you can uh, that you can meet those requirements. That's the most important part um, that, you know, that that's the preservation of life and safety first, and then we talk about everything else after that. Um, all right, Patty, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? And then I'll talk about, it. yeah. Yeah, I did. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the staffing audit um, for, for that, that matches AFL 21-11 for the audits um, for July of 2020 um, forward. Right now we're seeing that they're looking at July through September when they come out on the audits. I wanted to like just give an update on um, the most recent trends is um, surveyors are looking at, uh, the auditors are looking at the any sister facilities that send you staff. So making sure if you had staff sent to you from um, sister facilities because of COVID-19 related staffing shortages that they did sign in on the 530 form, what they were assigned, what they did. And um, along with your 530 form and your 612 form for that day, try to have a copy of the payroll record of um, them getting paid. And um, either it was paid by you or the other facility. And then also make sure you have some type of agreement with that facility um, for around that time that says that they're agreeing to send you staff. All of that will help capture that time. And um, in addition, this is something that's outside of what's on that AFL. This is the staff being sent from your own your own corporation uh, facilities, and we're seeing that come up right now. And I wanted to add also, Jason, that if um, anyone while you're in your staffing audit um, for 2020, um, and they're looking at those days, if anything comes up that's not right, or they're finding days, or the surveyor, the auditor is telling you something that doesn't make sense or it doesn't seem to align with the AFL, contact me right away before the exit. Um, get me involved before the exit so I can assist you. I can either get you over the correct information to provide the auditor and or I can elevate it above them to um, help get the proper education clarification to the staffing auditor because it's really hard after the exit to um, get any of that corrected or um, taken care of where you're in to, to prove your compliance. So that's, that's it, Jason. Okay. No, awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I, um, you know, I, I, I need big help on that regulatory side. So appreciate it. Um, there was a, a couple more questions. Um, um, and I'll try to interpret 
wh what this question means, but it says if the family doesn't have the vaccine but wants to visit their family, and that's still okay, um, you know, they're, uh, you know, we're only going to restrict them if they have, you know, signs and symptoms of COVID or, or, um, or, you know, they don't, um, you know, can't pass that screening when they come in. But in terms of if the family members have been vaccinated, they can still visit. It's just what the, uh, you know, what they're allowed to do with their loved one while they're visiting. Um, you know, that's really kind of the allowances for uh, the vaccine. So if a, a resident family member is not vaccinated, um, but the, uh, the family member is vaccinated, the CMS QSO says basically they can touch, but they should uh, still wear source control. So I think they're really going pretty far in terms of the allowance. Now, whether CDPH adopts that, I don't know, but uh, we definitely know even if they're not vaccinated, they can visit their family member. It's just what they can do with that family member is the difference. Um, are, aren't staffing audits required to capture audit days within 90 days of the start of the audit? And that was a question I think for you, Patty. Yeah, well, we, we, we had a meeting with CDPH on that and that's, um, that's a big part of our conversation. And um, currently that's not what's happening. Um, currently they're, they're picking days, they're in buildings right now and they're picking um, dates within um, the first 90 days of that auditing fiscal year, which started on July 1st. So the dates right now that so far that we know of, that we are aware of for the auditing that's taking place is, um, uh, of course, we could, you know, there could be other dates, so the, the ones that CAF is aware of right now, they're picking dates from July 1st through the end of September. And, um, and those are the only ones we've heard about so far. And, um, but you are correct on that statement, absolutely. And we did raise that to CDPH um, as, as an issue this morning as well. And they did, CDPH did state they're looking into that because um, that is not how it's supposed to be. Great. Um, and then I, I just want to mention, somebody put a comment in the question box about what the staffing auditors will want. It sounds like they're going to want hours as well as copies of licenses and certificates for nurses and or CNAs for many registries, as well as copies of invoices from those registries. So that's a great pointer. Um, as you get prepared for that staffing audit, you want to make sure if you yeah. use, keep all that stuff. So. Well, the staffing audit for registry staff is clear. The AFL is clear what you need to have in place for your, um, for those type. Where it wasn't clear was for, um, the, the, if you've used, um, even in the pandemic, um, extra language they put in the AFL regarding um, staff during the pandemic, they did not include the sister facility thing. So that's, everything else is pretty clear in there uh, as far as what you need, but you do need to make sure you have the contract with the registry that they signed in on the 530 form what they and proof of um, an invoice that you paid the registry. So um, good habit is after you pay the invoice for that person, attach a copy of the invoice to your 612-530 form for that day. So you can show that they were there that day. Also for registry, you usually at your station have a sign in and signed out binder for your registry. You could also have a copy of that available. Awesome, thanks. Is the info you discussed on new survey entrance applicable to ICFs? And if so, do you know if there's a link for that? Um, I don't think it's typically, it's, I don't think that ICFs use the same entrance. Um, I'd have to double check. This is um, a skilled nursing facility entrance checklist. So um, it's something they use every single year. It's a, it's a for a um, annual survey entrance checklist, and then there's a Title 22 entrance checklist. So for the ICFs, I will have to definitely check in with um, a little more research on that, but I could get back to you. Oh, perfect, Patty. Thank you very much. I, um, I, we've reached the end of our questions, and I really thought this, this webinar would go a half an hour. Uh, I'm glad you guys had lots of questions. I anticipate that we're gonna, I, I was hoping that we would not need these AFLs through May or these uh, webinars through May, but we're gonna keep them through the end of May. Uh, we may reduce the, the amount of time that it takes. And you know, my hope is to cut these back to a half an hour um, and, and really only address the big changes. Most of my world is back, uh, you know, doing work. So 
uh, it's, it's very difficult to continue to do this if there's no big changes. So we'll continue the, um, the webinars through May. Uh, we'll address any changes uh, on a weekly basis, but I don't anticipate these will need to be an hour. I think once these AFLs uh, come out, those uh, the differentiation between vaccinated and unvaccinated and what each is allowed to do, I think that's probably going to be a, a static uh, scenario for a while, unless we see a big surge or something like that. So um, my hope is that one, once these AFLs come out, we can kind of uh, take a break, breath for a little while uh, and incorporate our changes and, and uh, develop some, you know, kind of uh, standard operating procedures around these um, these requirements. So, hopefully, you guys have a wonderful weekend. As always, if you have questions, uh, Patty or I, um, Deanne, uh, Jamie, Summer, we're all happy to answer any of the questions you have. My email address is jbelden at calf.org uh, or p owens at calf.org if you want to reach us directly. Uh, we're happy to help anytime we can. So, you guys have a wonderful weekend. Thanks very much for everything you do. Take care. Bye, everyone.